Hi, everybody. In this interactive lecture, we're going to cover some argument basics. And these are um, some foundational concepts in critical thinking. And more specifically, we're going to take a look at an argument. What is an argument? We'll see some examples of arguments. Um, we're going to find out what a premise is, a conclusion is, and also how to put arguments into standard form. So first, what's an argument? Um, we all know that the word argument is kicked around in everyday language um, and used to mean some sort of emotionally charged dispute, like a fight. Like, oh man, I got in the worst argument with my girlfriend today. It was just terrible, right? And um, it's usually contentious and emotionally charged, a fight, right? But in logic and critical thinking, an argument is a much more um, defined concept. It refers to something quite different than just a fight, right? So an argument in general is a public, publicly expressed and hopefully logical tool of persuasion. It's trying to get you, it's a system of statements that are trying to get you to believe another statement. And more specifically, it's a group of propositions, which are statements, one or more of which are claimed to provide support for or reasons to believe another proposition. So the proposition that an argument is trying to get you to believe or accept is known as the conclusion and the propositions which serve as support for or evidence for or reasons to believe the conclusion are known as the premises. So let's take a look at a simple argument on both sides of an issue. So we'll have a pro and a con, just so that you can hear what an argument sounds like. So here's an argument that is in favor of universal health care, for instance. The U.S. should institute a universal health care program. The founding documents of the United States provide support for a right to health care, and the right to health care is an internationally recognized human right. Also, instituting a right to health care could lower the cost of health care in the United States and could stop medical bankruptcies. Now, we're going to get into this deeper, but for this particular argument in favor of universal health care, this would be the conclusion, right? The U.S. should institute a universal health care program. And then you can imagine saying, okay, but why? And then these statements would be the premises. Okay, hey, let's look at another one. This one's against universal health care. The U.S. should not institute a universal health care program. The founding documents of the United States do not provide support for a right to health care. Furthermore, a right to health care could increase the U.S. debt and deficit. It could also lower the quality and availability of disease screening and treatment and increase the wait time for medical services. So in this case, this first statement again, in this case, would be the conclusion. That's what this passage wants to convince you of. The U.S. should not institute a universal health care program. Okay, well, how come? And then the rest of these statements serve as the premises. So now let's break those things down a little bit. Right? We'll take a look at premises, conclusions, and like I said earlier, standard form. But first, 
we've mentioned the word proposition a few times, so let's just define. So what we're doing right now is we're gathering it, our tools, right? Everything that we're learning in this first lecture is, uh, you know, you're gathering the vocabulary and the tools that are common in uh, critical thinking and logic. Right? So what's a proposition? Simply, a proposition is a statement or a sentence with a truth value. And what a truth value means, it sounds like it could just mean it's true, right? Hey, a statement with a truth value. That sounds like you're saying something that's true, but that's not the case. A truth value means that it's possible, theoretically, to say true or false to it, or just unknown, right? But some examples are the following. The grass is green. You can answer true or false to that. This one happens to be true. Water is H2O. You can answer true or false to that. That one happens to be true. Um, pudding is delicious. Theoretically, that has a truth value. You can say it is true that pudding is delicious or it is false that pudding is delicious. Yes, I understand that you may consider that and that may in fact be a matter of opinion, but nonetheless, it is a statement that can hold truth or falsity, right? Or we ought to pass that law. That could be true or false. It makes sense to say, it is true that we ought to pass that law, or it is false that we ought to pass that law. That's really your technique for figuring out whether or not a sentence is has a truth value. See if the sentence would make sense if you put, it is true, or it is true that, or it is false that in front of it. Or murder is wrong. That's a proposition. There is life on other planets. That's a proposition. It has a truth value. It makes sense to say it is true that there is life on other planets or it is false that life, that there's life on other planets or we don't know whether it's true or false that there is life on other planets. So all of these are indeed propositions. Some examples of statements that are not propositions right? Sentences without a truth value. Just to, just to contrast, hand me that burrito. You can't say, um, it is true that hand me that burrito. That doesn't make any sense. That's simply a command, not a proposition. Or where did you sleep last night? It doesn't make sense to say it is false that where did you sleep last night? Not a proposition. Or Holy mackerel! It doesn't make sense that we don't know whether it's true or false that holy mackerel doesn't make sense. None of these are propositions. Next is a premise. A premise is the proposition or propositions that provide evidence or reasons to believe the conclusion. In other words, a premise provides support for a conclusion. Now, conclusion. Conclusion is the ultimate aim or goal of the argument which the premises are meant to support. The single proposition that serves as the one the argument is setting out to get you to believe, right? So in other words, the conclusion is the proposition that you're trying to convince people of. Now, I know it, a lot's getting thrown at you, but this is kind of the way you we got to um, dive in to all of these uh, concepts because we'll be using all of these concepts throughout the course. They're all critical. Um, in passages... Right? If you're given an argumentative passage, there's a series of words, there are some words and phrases that can help you figure out whether what you're looking at within that passage is a premise or a conclusion.
right? So some popular conclusion indicators are, therefore, it follows that in conclusion, right? So you'd have something like, therefore, we ought to have universal health care, or in conclusion, we ought not have universal health care, right? And then there are premise indicators that are sometimes there, sometimes not. They're just helpful in unpacking an argument and putting them into what's known as standard form, which we'll examine in just a bit. Premise indicators, um, some popular ones are since, because, um, considering the fact that, and then you'd attach the proposition, right? Since the founding fathers, let me start that over. Since the founding fathers intended to uh, allow for universal health care, it follows that we ought to institute universal health care or something like that. That's how these indicator words work. They are not always present, but they can be helpful when you've got a dense passage and you need to unpack it and find the conclusion and articulate the premises. So here's an example of an argument, simple argument with a conclusion indicator in it. Heavy alcohol consumption causes dehydration. Marathon runners need to keep very well hydrated. You're running a marathon tomorrow. Therefore, you should not go out binge drinking tonight. So in this case, here's your conclusion. Therefore is your conclusion indicator. And then you've got one premise, two premises, and three premises here. Same example, minus the conclusion indicator, but plus a premise indicator. Heavy alcohol consumption causes dehydration. Marathon runners need to keep very well hydrated. Given that you are running a marathon tomorrow, you should not go out binge drinking tonight. Conclusion remains the same. Same premises. You just have a little bit of a rearrangement of indicator words. Now, we're going to start talking about how you put an argument into standard form. And in this lecture, we're going to be doing this with very simple, very everyday arguments. But the idea behind putting an argument into what is known as standard form is that you are setting it up for an evaluation, which we'll be doing in a future lecture, right? Right now, we're just getting the basics down. But the reason you put an argument into what's known as standard form is it's to clean it up of any extra words any um, unnecessary commentary, any um, non-propositional sentences, and just show the bare bones of the argument so that you can evaluate it. It's a technique used by um, certainly logicians, certainly philosophers, but also um, lawyers, imperative to standardize arguments when you're a lawyer. A lot of information is thrown at you and it's important to clean it all up so that you can evaluate the argument for both its logic and its content. So let's look at how you do it in some examples. Step one, you look for indicators if they exist because they'll help you unpack the argument. Step two, you identify the conclusion and write it out 
in full sentence form at the bottom of the list. You're going to be making a list and I'll show you examples of this. Step three is identify the premises and list them numerically above the conclusion, omitting any indicator words and always in complete sentences. And then step four, make sure that you have omitted any non-working propositions and or just non-propositions from your reconstruction. Before we start looking at some examples and doing this together, um, a non-working proposition is one that, it's a sentence that has a truth value. You could say true, false, or unknown to it, but it just doesn't serve to support the conclusion. It doesn't serve as evidence, so you just ditch it. It's like trimming the fat. So here is our alcohol example in standard form. This is just a method and this is what it looks like, right? Here's our conclusion. You should not go out binge drinking tonight. Well, why not? Because of premise one, premise two, and premise three. Notice the list form, one, two, three, conclusion. Now let's go through some examples together. So first we'll get a passage that's an argumentative passage. And again, these are very simplified. We're going to work up to being able to do this for arguments that span multiple pages. That's really the goal. But we start small here. The two of you should not get a dog. First, you're rarely home. Second, one of you has severe pet allergies. And also don't forget that you're not yet financially ready for the expense involved in properly caring for an animal. Wake up, you two. So we look at this and we go, okay, we got to standardize it. Now here's how it breaks down. Here's that, this is that same passage from the previous slide, just for reference. And this is how you would standardize it. C for conclusion at the bottom. The two of you should not get a dog. Oh, how come? It's so cute. I love it. I want it. Well, premise one, you're rarely home. Two, one of you has severe pet allergies. Three, you are not yet financially ready for the expense involved in properly caring for an animal. And that's why the two of you should not get a dog. So notice the difference between the, the full passage and the breakdown. We've gotten rid of first, second, first and second, right? Because the numbers do that. Just make the claim. You're rarely home. One of you has severe pet allergies. In number three, we got rid of all this. And also don't forget that. And we just make the claim. You are not yet financially ready for the expense involved in properly caring for an animal. We got rid of this wake up you two, because it's really a command or an ex exclamation. It doesn't belong in the argument. Okay, let's look at another. Bob should not be trusted. He is a liar, a thief, a cheater, and he's been arrested three times for fraud of the elderly. And now here's the breakdown. Got our original passage here, right? This is trying to convince you that Bob should not be trusted. Well, why? He seems like a cool guy. Because, number one, Bob is a liar. A th he is a thief. Full sentences. He is a cheater. He has been arrested three times for fraud of the elderly. Now, notice something. In the original passage, we technically only have one sentence two sentences. But see what we've done here is you break this complex sentence down. This complex sentence serves as the premises for this conclusion, but it needs to be broken down and articulated. 
So that's what you do. You don't just pack all of this onto one line. You got to separate the bones out. You know what I mean? So you go, Bob is a liar. He is a thief. He is a cheater. He has been arrested three times for fraud of the elderly. You break down the different claims that are all made in one sentence to arrive at this standardized version. Ticks are pesky, dangerous, and ubiquitous. Therefore, they should be exterminated, seeing as how they carry Lyme disease. And then, here's the breakdown. And this one's just a tiny bit different because we have been seeing arguments where the conclusion has come either at the be very beginning of the passage or at the very end of the passage. And in this case, somebody tucked it right into the middle, which is, it reads lousy, but people will do that. So you got to use your, you look and you go, Ooh, there's a conclusion indicator. So for some reason they put the conclusion in the middle, right? So, Ticks should be exterminated. Well, why? They're creatures, living creatures like... If they, well, number one, they are pesky. Number two, they are dangerous. Number three, they are ubiquitous, just means they're all over the place. And four, they carry Lyme disease. There, There's the four reasons being offered in support of the conclusion. And again, you had to unpack a complex sentence here and articulate each premise. San Diego has an ideal climate. It also has richly diverse neighborhoods. It's the host city for Comic-Con, and it's the craft beer capital of America. San Diego rocks. Therefore, San Diego is truly the nation's finest city. Here's the breakdown. Obviously, this is trying to. You've got your conclusion indicator here. Therefore, San Diego is the nation's finest city. Well, how come? Why do you think that? Support your conclusion. Well, it has an ideal climate. It has richly diverse neighborhoods. Notice we cut the also out of there. You just don't need it. It's the host city for Comic-Con. It's the craft beer capital of America. And then this didn't make the cut. San Diego rocks. It's just, first of all, it's an, it can be viewed as an exclamation, right? It's just meant for a little flavor and color in the passage. Because if you think about it, when you, if you read passages that just go, you should believe this because of X, Y, Z, P, D, Q, it becomes very boring reading. So the way we write is we color and editorialize and add seasoning and flavor to our arguments. But what you want to do in the breakdown is clean it up of all of that. Really, you're making it bland and simple, right? What, do you, what does this passage want me to believe? And what are the individual reasons being offered as grounds for believing in this conclusion. What reasons are being offered in support of it? Marijuana is not physiologically addictive. It does not do a great deal of harm to the body's organs. Imagine what the livers look like in those alcoholic congressmen. Marijuana could provide a strong revenue source for the states, and heaven knows they could use it. The states could save a fortune in drug enforcement costs. I love marijuana. Hence, marijuana should be legalized. Uh, just a note, I borrowed these arguments from all over the place and just monkey with them. None of these necessarily express my personal views. <coughs> Excuse me. Here um, is the argument again, same. And then here's the breakdown. What's it trying to convince you of? When well, we got a conclusion indicator here, that's handy. Marijuana should be legalized at the federal level. Oops, this, I should have put that right here. Marijuana should be legalized. How come? Well, one, 
to. Third reason. Fourth reason. I love marijuana didn't make the cut because although it is a proposition, you can say it is true that I love marijuana or it is false that I love marijuana. It's what's known, as I mentioned before, as a non-working proposition. So it doesn't make the cut. It's color, flavor, extras, right? Here's the bones, the standard form. The youth of Athens are just like horses. Only a few specialized people can be said to improve horses. Therefore, only a few specialized people can be said to improve the youth of Athens. This is actually an argument from Plato's Apology. Conclusion. Handily, we have a therefore. But remember, those don't always exist. But... They're not in every argumentative passage, but you should look for them first, scan. Right? Conclusion is here with just two premises. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit since we've broken them down pretty um, carefully to this point. Performance-enhancing drugs should remain banned from sports. They destroy the spirit of sport, create an unfair advantage for those who use them, are terribly detrimental to one's health, and send the wrong message to children. Lance Armstrong is a total snake. This deserves a little bit of attention because you could get confused and think this is trying to convince you that Lance Armstrong is a total snake, but really the conclusion of the argument is this. Performance-enhancing drugs should remain banned from sports. And then this passage offers you one, two, three, four reasons in support of that conclusion. And Lance Armstrong is a total snake is just left out. It's not relevant to the conclusion. It's extra. Okay, so we've covered all of these topics and... Hopefully this puts you in a good position to do the assignment on this lecture, which is going to be um, breaking down a series of arguments and putting them into standard form.